better get me back, as it'll be dark soon, and they mostly come at night. Mostly. Welcome to Mostly Horror. <laughs> mostly. I feel weird, man. I'm used to having having this here. Also, nice, uh, nice horror. Yeah. Um, I'm Steve. That's Sean. I'm, no yeah, one, I'm Sean. I'm oh, the other guy. You're frozen. No. You were frozen. Dang. That Am doesn't I frozen right now? There we go. Now you're back. All right. You, were, you weren't frozen any other time. Well, I'm Steve. That's Sean. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't have your normal audio setup, which is fine. Yeah. So if you guys are listening to this intro uh, and then our interview, you're going to realize that our audio is... Actually, no, the audio in the interview is fine, right? No, no. It's no. no, yeah, the audio no. in the interview is a little strange. It's all AirPods, uh, so I apologize. That's yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> um, Liana Liberato is on today's episode. You yeah, know dude. her from Scream Six, or as I like to call it, Scrisixum, um, because it should have been it should have been called that. Um, if we would have asked Liana, she probably would have said so as well. Uh, she's also in a new Peacock show called Based on a True Story, which is very fun and very funny um, that you guys should check out. All eight episodes are out now. Um, great conversation. Great times. Great uh, insight into a, a, a backstory about a music video that you never would have thought. I feel like is the best way to explain it. Yeah, uh, that, uh, totally fair. Uh, I'm I'm not even going to say what it is. I'm just going to let us yeah. confront her in the in the interview. It's, but she's in a, so a music good. video that I love. I've watched yeah. a million times. That's the first thing. Uh, I'm yeah, excited for yeah. everyone to hear that part. Um, before that, though, uh, Chelsea's not editing this episode, so I'm going to say I have to scream. I don't have the sound bite to throw in, but just imagine the sound bite happening here. Um, but Sean and I talked about wanting to see the boogeyman. It came out Dude. a couple weeks ago. Came out a couple weeks ago, and we didn't have the opportunity to until uh, about a week ago on uh, my birthday. <laughs> I decided that I wanted to go see the boogeyman amongst you know just kind of hanging out during the day, and I think we both agree. At least I, I I know I can say this. It was probably the worst movie going experience I've ever experienced. Yep. Yep. Yeah. A hundred percent. We definitely so we uh weren't in a packed theater by any means. Um it's the theater that's close to where we live, which I won't dox us, but it's a it's a, it's a close theater. And the thing about this theater that I will say is that it is uh unkempt maybe is the best word for it there's sticky yeah. floors the screens aren't great the seats aren't updated they're old style seating which mm-hmm. is fine um but it's not you know the most top-notch movie theater but we were like all right we're just going to see a movie close by it and also have to address this uh i don't like this theater in general mainly because the floors are flat it doesn't have a there's a no theater decline. seating. it's not yeah, it's not stadium yeah. seating. It's it's yeah, just old school theater seating, um, which is I mean again, it's that's like the old old way, but it's not like even the, the old best. theaters that I can think of in Michigan have it, it's not it's not like a decline, but there's like stairs basically. It's like platformed. Uh, a lot of the sometimes. Ones yeah, it's... yeah, I know. Like Royal Oak is is flat. Um, I mean, I can think of a couple, but regard, I mean, you know, it's it's one of the more uncomfortable ways of sitting. But yeah, um, so you know, we're very excited to see this film, and I mean, we could just list the things that happened. You know, there there were people in front of us that were just passing around, um, loud crinkly bags the whole time. And the woman would leave and the man would decide that he wanted to leave with her to go wherever they were going for a couple of minutes. And then they would come back. And then about halfway through the film, they just left and didn't come back. Um, it was it was like a couple fighting, basically. It was she got up. Is, and like That's left. kind of what it seemed like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was like, he was like, yo, hey, chill out. And like went chasing after her. And it was just like, listen. And then they came back. And it, that's just it, that is continue 
I'm going to bitch about all yeah. of it in a collective I, after, but yeah. And I, I should also say that the boogeyman is, uh, a very pretty quiet movie, a pretty like, mm-hmm. you know, tension building quiet film. Um, yeah. outside of that, you know, I think to our right on our far right, there was someone talking and someone like turned around and just yelled, shut the fuck up to them. Like halfway cool. through the film. Um, but the most important aspect of this movie going experience was the fact that at, at the beginning, two children, like children, children, like five, maybe opened the theater door and were giggling really loudly. And uh, I think someone like, looked at them or shown a light at them or whatever it was. And they left. And then maybe 10 or 15 minutes later, those children along with their parents came in talking full volume uh, during this very quiet film, talking full volume, uh, basically theater hopping and trying to decide if they wanted to stay in this theater or not. Their conversations being normal volume, you know, we could all hear the decisions that they were making while they're doing that. The kids are running up and down the theater and I will say, like, you know, in our conversation with Liana, she talks about going to theaters when she was a kid with her mom and her running up and down theaters. And there's something to be said for, like, you know, a single parent not being able to, like, pay for childcare and, like, taking their kid to the film, whatever. Um, but, like, that's not what this was. This was very much, like, pe- like two parents and kids deciding that they wanted to theater hop and letting their loud kids run around without any, like, care for Super the people weird. around yeah. them. Yeah. Um, and so that, I mean, I know, again, I think I can speak for you here. I can't say how I feel about the boogeyman because I didn't feel like I experienced the boogeyman. I think about uh, 25 or 30 minutes in, I had the thought that I kind of just wanted to walk out because I knew that I wasn't going to get anything from the movie. And so I was like, well, do I just waste the next hour of my life like staring at the screen or do I just leave? Um So, yeah, it was not it was a bummer because I really wanted to watch the film um, and the things that I, you know, was paying attention to were fine. And I think I would have maybe enjoyed it a little bit more. But uh, what a bad, what a bad experience. All right. I I have to elaborate on everything. (laughs) Okay. So first off, we've talked a bit about, you know, there there were a handful of movies that we were excited to see this year. And we have felt fairly let down by most of the movies that have come out this year. I think partially is because last year we had such great you know flicks come out um some that yep. we expected to be great and were correct on and some surprise surprise su- ugh, surprise headers uh so after those i think it made me extra excited for this movie um mm-hmm. you know and the first and good I was horror just, film of the year yes i was just you <laughs> Essentially. Know, I was, I, yes i was pretty excited for it. i was like even if i don't love it i just mm-hmm. can't imagine that i'm not gonna have a good time and uh yeah. and yeah dude it's so there's the couple fighting uh that was sitting in front of us and leaving and coming back leaving and coming back um i think you mixed a couple things up so the at the beginning of the movie there were these two teens that were sitting in the back and i think they were arguing with each other too because one of them mm. literally had a scooter and a scooter scooter yeah. yeah he scootered down the theater whatever this was before the movie started so it was like yeah. i'm annoyed but Fine. technically i'm like you're not fucking with like whatever yeah. I, I get it that yeah. seems fun i get it but he scooters yeah. down <laughs> and he goes sits and then his friend like like walks up and goes and sits yep. with him and then when his friend sits down he gets up and he scooters to the back and they did this like a few times once the movie started it seemed like they were they were pretty done he did later do that once he scootered mm-hmm. out and then came back which was fucking annoying but whatever um but so so one couple scooter scooter kids and then there's another couple to our right that they weren't they mm. weren't fighting um audibly but they did get up and walk out uh she like it was she got up and like stomped away and then he looked confused and followed after her so i don't know if that was okay. like a spooky thing i doubt it it might have just been this movie theater going experience is bullshit um yeah <laughs> in in the back right uh there were people whispering the entire literally i don't think it must have just been one long run on sentence and this person just literally didn't know how to shut their fucking mouth oh i will also say you were sitting closer to the center of the theater i was sitting like all the way to the left so i 
I kind of had blinders yeah. to my right, but yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, we had slightly different experiences. You you heard more of the crumpling and stuff from the couple fighting. Yes. I was just annoyed with them getting up. Um, but yeah, so all right, so two couples fighting, scooter kid yep. whispering in the back, and then so when these when these kids come in, it was like halfway through the movie at least. Yep. When the kids came in playing the hide and seek, um, so it was extra. It's not like it's not like. First off, in my opinion, if the movies – you should be in a movie before it starts. I understand sometimes you're running a little bit late. I personally will skip yep. a movie if I'm late for it most of the time. Um, yeah. But – Yeah, we if, were late for movie's... Suspiria, and we were almost like, uh, yeah. should we still yeah. like watch but, this? Yeah. Yeah, which is another terrible movie experience that we had. Uh, at least one, one of my things is like overall it was fine with that one dude with that fucking candy wrapper. But, dude, yep. these kids come in like halfway through – near nearish the end maybe like two-thirds of the way through and they're playing hide and seek they're they're mm. like coming in and they're by the door and they're giggling pretty loudly and going in and out and this happens like a couple times and i'm to a point where i'm like and they're they're kids too like they are they're like five six years old or maybe yep. maybe like up to eight maybe up to eight i and thought they were yeah they were pretty young yeah. And in my head, I'm like, dude, I don't want to be the guy that yells at a bunch of kids, but I'm going to, I'm losing my cool. Like I'm really starting right. to, to get, I, by this point, I'm so fucking annoyed with everything um, yeah. that I was like, I'm going to lose it on these kids. And the last time they came in, they're extra loud. And you're right. They came in with parents and the parents are like, like shushing them, but like laugh shushing them. Like it's all just a fucking joke yeah. to them. Like yeah. literally they didn't give these a shit. Are, these are, yeah, these are the kinds of people that have – they're just oblivious to, like, how anything that they do affects other people. So inconsiderate. Yep. And, dude, I mean, you saw me. I stood up. I just, like, pissed off. I looked them, like, dead in the eye. I marched right through them. I went to security, mm -hmm. and I had them kicked out of the theater. Like, the whole fucking yep. family. Um, fuck, fuck that family. Fuck those parents. Fuck them kids. I say that with <laughs> a cold heart. You don't – you don't <laughs> – you don't do that. It's it's disrespectful. It's not my job as as a customer of a place to be understanding of your situation. And if you if you don't have the ability yourself to to control yourself or your kids, then I'm sorry, you just don't. There's just certain places you're not supposed to be. Maybe theaters yeah. should have like all kids viewings, whatever. But I know that I wasn't yeah. that kid. You know, if your kids I'm, aren't old enough to handle a movie theater, then then you don't get to go to a movie theater until until they are. Yeah, and I would say like if you bring your kid to a theater and they start acting up and they and you take them out, you know what I mean, or like you leave, mm -hmm. like that's one thing, you know what I mean, like that makes complete yeah. sense. But I understand to like to to be yes. completely oblivious to everybody else. Like I mean, right? I say this all the time, like theaters and uh, museums and zoos should have like eighteen and up hours. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like the, and it yeah. should be most well, of them. Um, I... Like it's just yeah. I think that there are so many, like there, there are different accommodations that, and I understand like the theater, the theater industry is already struggling with stuff, but there's like, like there should be movie theaters where you have subtitles. Like this specific theater always has subtitles. I wouldn't want that in every mm -hmm. theater because for me it's distracting, but I want people to be able to have that. Kids should be yeah. able to go to the movie theater. And I, I don't think that, I just think that there, yeah, you need to have, different time slots for different things for sure and i think if, yeah. if you want to like, have a movie where a bunch of kids get yeah. to run around and play and watch it that's totally fine but yeah. that can't be every movie um yeah and regardless i wish i wish adam from eye of the duck would have been with us uh just knowing his God, personality dude. and him talking about how he is in movies like yeah. that um but the at the end of the day the boogeyman's rated r they weren't supposed to be yeah. in that movie like that's yeah. like you know besides the point like they were theater and Listen, I've theater hopped in my day, you know, but sure. like now if I want to see two films, I'll pay for two movies. <laughs> like, right. it's just if, like, I, I get it, but don't, don't uh, go into a, the boogeyman knowing that your kids aren't able to see that and yes. knowing that you're just going to cause a ruckus. Yeah. Well, no, it's, I mean, the first few times they, it was, it was parents that were just completely unattentive. They were probably in line, not paying attention to what their children were doing. And then when they came into the theater that their kids were going into, they were just laughing at the situation. If you, if you want a theater hop, like I'm not going to shame you for that, but go to a movie at its beginning and do it yeah. fucking silently. Don't, if you're in a movie, then you don't, you're, you're not on your phone. You're not causing light distractions for other people and you're shutting the fuck up. 
and that's just the only yeah. way. Yeah, that's the only way to do it. And if you can't do that, then you don't belong there. That's yeah. just, I was so mad. And I also would have 100% left that theater if it wasn't your birthday experience. Like, I didn't want to walk yeah. out on you guys. I was like, I don't yeah. want to be a dick. I don't know if there is pissed. I'm sure Steve is not stoked right now, but I'm yeah. not trying to. Um, no, if, if it was just Sydney and I, because yeah. there was like a bunch of us, yeah. but if it was just Sydney and I, I would have been like, hey, is it okay if we leave? And like, we would have just yeah. left. Um, yeah. But it was just a, a weird situation. Yeah. Um, did you, you, you had a different type of theater experience recently that I yes. feel like we should talk about before we uh, yes. jump into the interview. Yeah, I do. I, I just want to bring this up quickly. Uh, just because AI just had a fun night. I, um, yeah. I, so we were invited to go see uh, Little Shop of Horrors off Broadway. Um, Little first Shop. off. So you've seen it a couple times. Uh, you, you saw it. Yeah. You, all right. So you saw it a few years ago. And then you just yep. saw it like a week, a week last week yep. with uh, mm-hmm. some family that you had in town. And dude, holy shit, that performance is stellar. I know like we briefly yeah. had a text conversation, but truly one of, if not like my favorite theater going experience that I've ever had. And I've seen some yeah. great shows. Um, yeah. It, the cast killed it. It felt like it, it felt so true to the movie while definitely being yeah. its own thing. Honestly, most of the time, like most of the time, I, I like I have to figure out how to say what I want to say. It, a lot of the time, even if I love like a theater adaptation of something, I love it in a very different way, and I don't compare it to movies. And they're different mm-hmm. things. Um, and the movies, what I'm seeing most of anyway, so my heart mm-hmm. is often more in that for me. I would watch this performance over the movie any day, and I love the. It was yeah. absolutely stellar. The puppetry was yeah. so cool. It's insane. like they, oh, dude, they pulled every stop, and there yeah. were there were just things like I would be trying to break down exactly how they're doing it. Would notice certain things, but would be the illusion was completely kept in others. It was just really, really, really good. Um, yeah, and yeah. everyone that's in it right now is amazing. The songs were yes. like I I will say when I saw it in February of 2020, um, mm-hmm. Christian Borel was um he was one of the so this is a this is a re um whatever it's called like so little shop has been a musical before like a stage musical yeah. they brought this back to off broadway and christian borrell is the guy who originated in this like rebirth um mm-hmm. doc dr orwin orvin whatever dds like and he, he was so funny. just so so the yeah that that dentist it was great in this version but the the original dentist I saw years ago was just like so much better and I wish that you would have gotten to see him but um yeah I, I mean Seymour is amazing Audrey's amazing um the the set is so cool and how it changes is so great they're salt like suddenly Seymour and um somewhere that's green are we're both so good like i got goosebumps yes. with both performances um specifically suddenly seymour i fucking love that song um yeah yeah it's just it's it's a it's a phenomenal show and also it's just it's such an intimate uh theater so you're yes. you're so yeah. close no you're matter right where there. you are you're so close yeah. yeah yeah it was um it was fucking brilliant i the guy the guy that i saw playing that doctor like the the fact that you're telling me that you saw an even better like yeah. <laughs> performance of that is yeah. mind blowing to me because that dude was great. Fucking nailed it. It was so funny. I was yeah, I mean, it was I, this most recent one that I saw was was hilarious. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, the Christian Borrell's performance is just my favorite. But I'm regardless. Sure. I mean, the one I just saw a week ago was was great as well. Um, yeah. I loved. Yeah. I loved it. It's so but good. dude, I just had it, it was so fun because like, you know, we, we got invited, so I technically got to see the show for free. You didn't go with me, so it was just me. And I was like, mm-hmm. Oh, I'm having a little outing on my own and you know, I travel down there, I get there because I I, you know, didn't get tickets. I'm like, Well, I'm gonna support the theater, so I bought two beers while the show was there going on and uh enjoyed those and then leaving, it was such a nice night that I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna. I kind of have to pee, but I don't want to head right to the subway. Like I'm gonna yeah. find an area, and I walk by this gay bar. <laughs> I walk by this bar, and I, I probably in Hell's like, Kitchen oh. somewhere. 
it says, yes, I was in Hell's Kitchen. I, yeah. I walk by this bar and I'm like, I can use their bathroom. And that sign says $5 frozen margaritas. And I'm like, fuck yeah. <laughs> and then I get inside, I pee, I go up. I'm like, is this still, uh, are you guys, is that sign still good? They're like, yep, all the time. And while I'm there, I realize like, oh, this is a gay bar. Straight up my favorite bar in the whole city right now. I had such a good time. <laughs> <laughs> like the music every like the vibe was just solid i had uh a, a five dollar frozen margarita a guinness and then i had a watermelon a spicy watermelon margarita and by then i was feeling it uh yeah. and i was texting our buddy cody uh closer to like upper west side and i was like you know what i'm gonna go up yeah. to that bar i had a whole outing on my own man i went and had oh you went up another place. you went up there Nice. Yeah, dude. Okay, I didn't know so that. I ended up, dude, th- four beers, four different beers, and two different margaritas. I was tanked, man. I had to get an nice. Uber home. Nice. <laughs> and, yeah, <laughs> and uh, I ended up, dude. I had like the gnarliest blood blister uh, that I got on my hand. No clue how I got it. Overall, <laughs> ten out of ten night. Ten out of ten Friday night, New York City. Just me, myself, wow. and I. Yeah, dude. That's uh, good stuff. that's how you do it. If you got to pick a yeah. way to do it. That's how 100%. you do it. So come well, to New York. Uh, yeah, come try, to New York. Find a little hate gay bar. The, go see little shop. Hate the movie. <laughs> hate the movie theater going experience, but enjoy the theater theater going experience. Yes, um, exactly. We have a great interview with Liana Liberato. Um, absolutely love talking to her. Um, and you guys will get to in just a moment. Sean, any final thoughts on the interview before we let them get on over to it? We mentioned this you know, at the start of the, the interview, but I'm going to say it now as well. This is a spoiler oh, yeah. episode, guys. It's just so it's plain spoilers. and simple. We're not even going to give you times. We're going to talk about the movie. If you haven't seen the movie, you need to not listen. And we spoil. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This, the, the movie and the show, absolutely. But specifically with Scream 6, I'm telling you right now, it's not little spoilers. We will completely fucking ruin the movie for you. So <laughs> don't don't listen if you haven't yeah. seen it. Go pause it. Go yeah. watch um liana was awesome to talk to man uh you know tons of insight it was so fun uh chatting about her early career and some of the cool things she got to do she had some unique experiences um and just yeah man it it was just a good time and i really like the things that i want to say i don't want to say in this moment i'm gonna let them hear they'll hear it so soon yeah yes so uh but yeah you you guys are gonna dig the episode it's a good one hell yeah on that note we will get you guys over to our interview with liana liberato uh stick around we have some listeners submitted mostly horror wrecks for you guys this week so we'll catch you on the other side (laughs) All right, we are joined today by Liana Liberato. Liana is an actress who has worked in the excuse me, an actress who has worked professionally since she was nine, recently appearing in Scream Six as Quinn Bailey and Peacocks based on a true story as Tori Thompson. Liana, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. I first we're gonna mention this in the intro to this episode, but we have to stress if anyone is still listening to this and hasn't seen Scream Six or watched Uh, based on a true story there will be spoilers in this and we cannot recommend enough that you just turn off this podcast normally you won't hear people saying like stop listening to us but like straight up stop stop listening to us um before we get into you know the horror genre and the things that you've worked on in that space we have to talk about what is arguably the most influential important role that you've had (laughs) in your career (laughs) <laughs> um which is you were in the seven things i hate about you music video oh my god yes, <laughs> yes. i was i was yeah uh, when i yeah oh it's amazing when i found out about that i just started geeking i, I was doing doing research going through stuff uh while watching um based on a true story and i'm a I am a big, like, that era of Miley fan. Uh, so I had seen you in that video for, you know, countless times. Uh, I just have to ask, like, what was that like? What Do you remember much from that set? I'm, it seemed like you were fairly young, but but what do you remember from that that shoot? I, I actually have, like, a really weird story of how I landed in that video. Um, yes. And it's funny because 
now that I'm older, I think when I was younger, I the last thing I would ever want to do is talk about the truth behind the video. But now that I'm older and like friendly with <laughs> this person, it's like kind of a sweet thing to look back on. But okay. um, so I grew up with Miley's brother, Brazen. And for like years, I had the biggest crush on him, like a huge crush. We were like best friends. And I just always, he was just like my best friend. And I thought like we were meant to be, which is so funny because <laughs> I was like, I kid you not, probably 11 years old. Wow. And <laughs> um, one of my friends was uh, staying the night at my house for a few nights because her, her family was out of town and she had an audition for the Seven Things music video. I did not have an audition for this. And I um, I went with her because she was young and my, like my mom and I went with her and we were just sitting in the lobby and I was asked if I wanted to audition for it. And I was like, I mean, sure, I'm not doing anything. I might as well <laughs> just go in there. Wow. And, um, and then I got the job and I was so embarrassed because I was like, oh my gosh, the last thing I want is for Brazen to think I like wanted to be in this music video or try Like I just didn't, I just felt so awkward. And I remember getting on set that day and he was there because he was a kid too. And he like probably had to go on set and like do schoolwork with his mom. Wow. And he saw me and he was like, Liana, what are you doing here? And I was like, surprise. <laughs> it was all and a then, ploy. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. That was so interesting. And then his girlfriend at the time, who's a good friend of mine still, he invited her to be a part of the music video as, as well. And when I found that out, it broke my heart naturally. And, um, and then the director of the music video was like, is there anyone that like could cry right now? And I was like, absolutely. I will cry for you in an instant. <laughs> That's so good. So, that is the truth behind the tears of the seven thing music video is my heart was just absolutely crushed and broken. And I was in love with Brazen Cyrus. <laughs> <laughs> the clips that I am going to make from this segment of this episode. <laughs> we could end so we could end it right now and this would be Ooh, perfect. You, that you is say, yeah, that's the I best thing about record. Tears. There's uh I think there's two of you in the video that that deliver some tears if I remember correctly, but you it they, they got like four shots of you. It cuts back to you yeah. crying a few different times and I was going to say you gave an Oscar worthy performance and now having that uh that back that background information on how you did it is beautiful yeah <laughs> now, you have, now you have the truth behind it it's so funny because i actually ran into brazen like like a couple years ago in nashville and he's like he's so lovely and he's married and he has a kid and i'm like so happy for him and it's mm -hmm. but it's just such a you know like that like adolescent like like totally. first love is just so it, I just I think it's such a funny story <laughs> it hurts yeah I yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're past that you know I'm glad you got over it because that definitely sounds like a you know a core memory uh, in, a, in not a great way oh, yeah. um wow I don't even I don't even know how to go past that but we have to so uh speaking of core memories a question that we ask everyone on this show um is we'd like to know about your intros to the genre. So we always kind of tee it up by saying, you know, was there a film that was playing in the living room that you kind of snuck out and saw that you weren't supposed to, or maybe someone rented you a film, you know, that you maybe shouldn't have been watching at that age? Like, do you remember your first exposure to the horror genre at all? I do. Yeah. I, um, gosh, I actually have a few memories that pop up. Um, I remember um, being on the Disney cruise when I was a kid. And my mom has, she's, I mean, I think I get my love of film from my mom. Like she, when she was pregnant with me in Texas, she had no air conditioning. And like the only thing she would do is go see movies. And even when I was a kid, she would go see a movie and I just run up and down the aisles. And I was exposed to film at a really young age. And she like, wasn't really afraid to show me any type of film. Um, and I remember being on the Disney cruise and my mom was like, let's go see signs. And, yeah. um, and yeah. I barely made it 
the movie. They, I, when the fingers got chopped off, I screamed bloody murder and my mom had oh. to take me out of the theater. And, um, and then I had little moments after that where I grew up in this um, apartment complex for actors called Oakwood Apartments. Mm. And, um, and I remember I always hung out with kids that were a little older than me and they would have like, like a movie day mm. <laughs> and they played, um, what are those spoof movies? Why am I blanking on it? It's like they spoof all the S- horror movies. Scary, scary, scary movies. movies. Yeah, so they played a scary movie, and I think it was the one with uh, Samara, and yep. that terrified me for years, which is hilarious because it's a spoof. But um, you didn't, know and I, <laughs> <laughs> I was so scared, and I, yeah. I like remember having to sleep with my mom, um, and I would have nightmares, and um, and then I got to a point where I was like a little too old to be that scared of things, of of scary movies, and. I got so annoyed by it that I decided to introduce, reintroduce myself to the genre and like force myself to like horror movies. So I started with The Shining and Rosemary's Baby. And um, yeah, I would just like go to Blockbuster and rent movies and try to get through them and watch them. And then I fell in love with the genre. Um, And that was probably when I was like 14. And I never looked back. Wow. Hell yeah. 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 Self made. Uh, it's scary. <laughs> yeah. 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 Scary movie three, I think, is the one with Samara, um, which is my favorite. Yeah, the one. ring. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need Those to rewatch good. it. Those yes. Are good. It's, yeah. They're, it's goofy. They're good. It, it's know, also, it, it's, it's also, yeah, it's funny. It's funny to think about those in the context of the new screen films com- like, co- still coming yeah. out. Um, because that was the, you know, obviously, like they spoofed so many films, but that mm. was the direct, like, spoof that they were doing. Um, and yeah. it just makes like those spoofs fizzled out. So it makes you think what those would be like now if they were still doing scary movies. You know? Right. Yeah, that's so true. I do feel like, I mean, Scream does do a really good job at like being very aware of itself and like super yeah. satirical. And that is like kind of a version of that now. But 100%. Yeah. that was that was a special time. Those those uh scary movies. Yeah, I I have a quick follow up question just because I'm curious. You talked about the apartment complex that you were in and not to keep talking about your your early career but is that the is that what the new york times article that you were like a part of was about yeah that's that's what it was about can you like talk just a little about that because i i saw that you were on a new york times article about like growing up in hollywood and i was like we don't need to talk about your child like acting career that long but i'm just really curious (laughs) like what is that apartment for young actors yeah, I know it sounds so weird. I um it doesn't exist anymore, which is crazy. I mean, like the the complex does, but it's an entirely different name and the like I don't think that they do what they used to do with child actors, right. but I I mean, I'm pretty sure like Shia LaBeouf lived there, Hilary Duff lived there. Um and it's kind of in, in the center of uh Burbank where there's like a lot of uh studios. Um, so it was a very easy access for actors to like audition and work. Um, but honestly it was like a really, really fun time for me because I didn't feel very connected to the people I grew up with in Texas. Um, and moving out to LA and I was around a lot of people who had very similar interests. Mm -hmm. Um, I made friends really quickly and it was a very safe community. So I would go and I would like homeschool at, from like nine to noon. And then mm-hmm. I would walk outside my apartment and go to like the playground or the pool and just run into a bunch of kids my age. And we would just hang out all day and play games and watch movies and everything like that. Um, but it was a really interesting community. They like would bring in agents and do acting classes and all kinds of stuff. I mean, I know that I'm pretty sure Josh Hutcherson talks about it a little bit too, because he was there for a period of time. And I think he had like a hard experience. I didn't, I had a really, I, I think I, I met most of my best friends like to this day from that place. Um, but yeah, the New York times did come in and do a, an article about a few different kids who lived there at the time. Um, and yeah, it was really interesting. I I haven't read it in a while. I can't remember what they said, but 
It was, yeah. it's just, it's just a, it's a funny little place, but I'm really grateful for it. Yeah. It's, I, I feel like we could do a whole episode or a whole like podcast could be done about like something like that, you know, like this, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't want to make it sound bad, but like a factory almost for, for child actors. It sounds like, like this, this community, this, this school for it. That sounds uh, it's really interesting. There's actually a documentary out about the Oakwood apartments. It's called the Hollywood complex. I wish okay. I knew what platform it was on, but it, it, it perfectly captures the experience and like the social life of that community. And I was actually living there at the time they filmed it. I don't know how I dodged those cameras, but like, <laughs> I know like every kid in that documentary. Um, and it's very accurate. It's a really, it's a really interesting documentary. It makes you as an actor, like really very, feel very grateful. It made me feel very grateful for like my journey, but yeah, you should check yeah, it out. Sure. It's cool. Yeah. Oh, I, I you were too busy with auditions. That. I said you were too busy with auditions, so you. you're yeah, so busy. <laughs> um, speaking of, it's. Uh, I, I want to bring up. I, I know Steve was saying, you know, move on from uh, from from early <laughs> career, but I, I do have a couple a couple questions about it. it. It seems like you really hit the ground running. Um, you know, it, it, if we're correct, you started acting at around the age nine and landed your first role in Cold Case uh, on ten, and went on to things like CSI Miami. And then you were in a film called Trust uh, by David Schwimmer. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, all of those have these these darker theme, themes, especially Trust. And I'm just curious what it was like being that young and tackling some roles like that. Again, specifically Trust, it, it seems like it, it would have been a pretty intense shoot. And I'm, I'm wondering how that might have um, impacted you personally and as well your career, like what, what you took away from from roles like that? Yeah, I initially, when I moved out to LA, I, the, the journey to get me to LA was really this desire to be um, like a Disney or Nickelodeon kid, because that was really the only material I was ex exposed to. You sure. know, I, whenever I would come home from school in Texas, I would be watching Disney Channel. I'd be watching Lizzie McGuire and stuff like that. And um, I didn't really like think about being a dramatic actress um, or just doing material that was a little bit more mature for me. Um, and I tried. I When I initially moved out here, I auditioned all the time for Disney things and Nickelodeon things, and they just weren't interested in me at all. <laughs> I think I wasn't very animated. I, I didn't really, I think I would receive these scripts and be like, oh my gosh, this girl, she's trying to find her puppy and it's not funny. <laughs> like I would really try to like take things so seriously and play it as truthful as possible. And and I, I guess maybe I was too depressing for Disney, but <laughs> I, um, I just found a lot more luck in, in like doing guest stars on dramatic um, networks. So um, it wasn't without effort. I definitely tried, but I think that just life had other plans for me. And then I, I started to really, I mean, I always liked it, but I, I started to feel very comfortable in the genre, like in the dramatic genre. Um, and I realized that I did have the ability at a young age to like cry on cue and do stuff like that. And that was at the time, like super valued in kids. And, um, and so that's sort of why I started booking the things that I did. And then when trust came along, I had done, I think, two movies. They were smaller films and a bunch of guest star roles. And I was so ready to, at the age of 13, like take my career to another level and without really knowing what that meant. But I was just ready for a challenge. And um, and then Trust came along. And ironically, I, I just remembered this the other day when I was talking to someone. I was in the running also at the same time for a Disney movie at, thir at, at 13. So I was auditioning for Trust and this Disney movie right around the same time. And I lost out on the Disney movie. And I was so sad. <laughs> and because I was like, this is the this is it. This is the opportunity that I that I've been waiting for. Right. And then when it fell through, I was so sad. And then I had 
um, kind of trust like looming around and I was waiting to hear on that. And I was like, oh gosh, here, here, like I'm going to get let down again. And then I got it. And it's funny because I, it's exactly what I, it was exactly what I wanted. Um, and I had an amazing time filming that. I think I was very, very protected um, by everyone on that film. I think okay. there was not a single person who was on that set that didn't understand the gravity of what we were making. Right. And especially David. Um, and he really, really took care of me and kept my parents in the loop the entire way. And, um, and I feel like that definitely was the biggest learning experience for me sure. as an actor and sort of opened the gates of me like thinking, Oh, like I could actually like make a career out of this. This is can't, this might not be a hobby anymore. Um, like I want to be a serious actor. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like it was tough material, but it also was like one of the best experiences I've ever had. Yeah. And that is, I mean, I, that's great to hear. <laughs> yeah. And really like at, good. I mean, you're 13, 14, you know, getting a film or really starring in a film that's at TIFF. Like that's, you know what I mean? Like you could be on Disney Channel, but you're like, that's like what a way to establish yourself. You know what I mean? Like to, yeah. to be on that sort it, of stage it, too. And you, you were praised for your performance. I mean, I, I just watched it recently for the first time and holy shit, like it's, it's a, it's, it touches on really dark things, but you go to some pretty intense places. There's, there is screaming and crying that's that's really nuts i know that you won the silver hugo award for best actress i think in uh at the chicago international film festival for that and like different things like it it's just nuts <laughs> it was a, a crazy role <laughs> yeah it really was i actually watched it probably like five or six years ago and i do it i was kind of shocked as well over like someone like being my age and taking on such serious material, but yeah. I, I, I don't think I fully understood, to be honest. I, now that I'm older, I, I get it a lot more now, but I think I was just really young and being exposed to all of these new things all at once. And mm -hmm. I was just sort of taking it as it came. And it really was only until a few years later that I was like, Oh my gosh. Like, I think a lot of people were starting to come up to me and, and kind of talk about the effects that movie had on them. And I, it, cause you're kind of in your own bubble when you're playing a part like that, you know, you're just trying to get through it. And so, um, afterwards I was like, Oh wow, we, we really like made something super impactful. That's really cool. <laughs> but, yeah. but also too, like the, you watch the film and you, you, you watch a character like really go through something. But for my experience filming it, you know, like all of the scenes that I had with um, Charlie, um, the uh, like the predator. I mean, that was I think we filmed all of those scenes in like four days, but we were filming the movie for like a month and a half. So I really only had like four days of an uncomfortable experience. Okay. And then everything else was either with Clive or Catherine or Viola. And they were such a joy to to be around and and we played games on set and everything. So, um, yeah, it wasn't as if like I was really going through what Annie was going through, but I'm sure from an outside perspective, it looked like that. Sure. Hey, the film, <laughs> even just the what film you did filmed. its job. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Even just what you filmed. I was like this, I feel like this would have been an intense experience, but that makes sense. You know, you, you get all the, the rough stuff out of the way and, <laughs> and you have. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. like you're filming like a super intense scene and then you have to go on to the next scene so it's not like like i'm screaming at clive in one scene sure. and then like we take the lunch break and then the next scene is like me with my bestie or like something like that and yeah. you kind of mentally have to like like shift something sure. so yeah. you know it doesn't like linger as much yeah that's that, that like obviously knowing that but with acting is just still insane to really realize that that's what you guys are i just yeah. imagine like you dumping yeah. a bucket of water on yourself to like reset and like you're like all right yeah. I'm, at, I'm at zero now and i can like build up to whatever else you know sure. honestly i feel like if i were to take on a role like that now i probably would have to do that but 
when you're a kid, you're just so resilient and like, yeah. it is make believe in so many ways. Like I did take a little bit of that with me when I, when I rapped, but I, but yeah, it's, it just felt like pretend plain pretend, you know? Yeah. Maybe that's, maybe that's better. <laughs> maybe that's I better. So. I definitely so, strive for that mentality yeah, still. <laughs> yeah. So you went, you know, TV dramas, dark film material, uh, and then horror and murder and true crime. So we have to, you know, we want to talk about Scream and, and based on a true story. Um, I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, but being a horror fan or, or at least um, enjoying the genre, what is your favorite scream? We're not going to count six, but if you had to choose and we can battle over it, I mean, opinions are opinions. <laughs> I, I'm just curious. I, I would love to, to know. I would love to know yours as well. I would say the first one. I mean, I, I did like, I, the first one was the first scream I ever saw, obviously. Mm-hmm. And yeah. all of those actors, especially like, I mean, the original ghost faces, they laid the foundation of all of the rest that come after them. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I would say the first one, but then I also do have, um, I do feel like I have a connection to two just because I feel like six is pretty reminiscent of it. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, I would say one and two would be my favorite if I couldn't say six. <laughs> that's true. Listen, that's that's fair. That's fair. We we only really go to war if someone says like three is their favorite, or at least I feel like I need to go to war if someone's like three is my favorite. I'm like, all right. It's but, it's such a uh, unique franchise where I think that like anyone's favorites, whatever order they put them in, is is valid. Um, I'm weird. I know that I get some shit because I honestly go one and then I think six. I think I like jump so much and a lot of people are like, what do you mean? Like six is great, but what do you mean? You know, like it's, it's, you have the diehards, um, you know, for the original trilogy or, or at least one and two and then they hate three. Like it's a very, um, it is a, a, a fandom. I've never seen more people disagree in a fandom, I don't think, than, uh, yeah. than in the screen. Right. I do think that's kind of what makes the the movie so special is because people people connect to 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 such a like different variety of them if that makes sense yeah. like everyone has their own their reasons for liking each different movie and I I think that's cool um I I loved I loved six, like just as a fan. I actually met a lot of people who say one and six are their favorite, which makes me really happy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's just people that uh that are really like pressed about the Nev Campbell thing or or you know what I mean? Like you're you're absolute diehards. Um but it's it is what it every is. Every movie brings something different while while staying in this unified uh place. And that's super so, understandable. I mean, she's literally like the heart of this franchise and that's, yeah. she's the reason why people have held on for so long and watched all of these movies. And I do think like, and Matt and Tyler have such an, an immense amount of respect for her and love her. And, and I think the great thing is too, is like, I don't, I don't necessarily think her story is over. I obviously can't, speak for anybody but i at least being on on set that was never ever ever like a a conversation like she's still very much prevalent in like the scream world yeah Yeah, i i do not trust the marketing or any news anything like i don't know if that if the the money debates were even real i thought she was gonna be the killer i thought she was gonna be the killer i said it (laughs) we we said we we got yeah, we had a we were lucky enough to go to a screening, and we're all like, "Sean's pointing at you on the poster, going, it's her." Um, I just need to reiterate: spoiler, 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 spoilers to anyone listening. But yeah. Sean's po- pointing to you, and I'm pointing to like I think Samara, um, but I'm like I don't I don't know who it's gonna be, but I'm like you know who it's really gonna be. Nev's gonna come back, yeah, and no one's no one's <laughs> gonna would've... even think that would have been so epic. Yeah, that would have been I... very epic. I didn't think that she was going to be the killer, but I did think that that there was a a chance that everything that we had seen in the news about her not being involved in the movie 
was just to like really throw people off and to surprise bring her in. And I still think she'll be in the next one. But uh, like Steve said, I was looking at the poster and uh, there's a quote I, from another interview that you did where you were talking about um, really being excited for, for this role and things uh, because you don't usually get to take on roles like this because you have a, a very like nice person face. You don't look mean. And I got to tell you, that I picked you out instantly. I was like her, <laughs> the, the one person that I was like, oh, if anyone, one of these people's the killer, it's her. And I will say that you, you fooled me when you died. You did get me. I okay. went, oh well, I guess not. So that of that worked on me. But before that, yeah. I was on to you a hundred percent. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it was a hard secret to keep. That's for sure. Because and okay. I kept it from like literally everyone. Uh, like even my friends and my family. Um, and, but I'm glad I still fooled you. Yes. And, but honestly, I, I had heard rumors about even on scream five, like actually they weren't, they weren't rumors. They were true. They, they like literally gave the cast like different endings. So I'm pretty sure like when they were, when they were on set, um, like the cast, they, they were like, are you the killer? Or am I the killer? Like how, who's, who's behind this? Like they didn't really know. So when I signed on, I was like, I don't believe anything. Like if they say I'm the killer, I don't know for sure if I am. I and they, anything could change in an instant. So um, yeah, I definitely took everything with a grain of salt for a while. That's yeah. It's I, it's so funny that you bring that up. Cause I was going to say, you know, with the, with the whodunit nature of the franchise, there's obviously a lot of secrecy. I think I also saw you say that when you initially auditioned for the movie, you didn't even know that it was a scream movie. You just kind of, you know, Mm -hmm. read this character, sent it out. And then even upon getting, you know, your role, you didn't know her full story. And you found that out later after arriving on set. Can you speak more to to all of the secrecy and and, in terms of what they told you when what cast members knew as you were filming? Can you can you expand on that at all? Yeah, I um, when I originally got the audition, it was for an untitled spyglass paramount movie Mm -hmm. um and the the sides were like super vague um i believe it was like a like a sort of version of my introduction scene where i talk to melissa's character outside of my bedroom and tell her that um jenna went to a like a frat party or something and um and yeah that one (laughs) (laughs) but the scene was like uh, yeah, it was, it captures sort of like the essence of Quinn. Um, but I, it felt very vague. And so I was like, okay, this, these are definitely dummy sides. This must be, uh, uh, this must be a big ish movie. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I taped it and then I left the country <laughs> and didn't think anything of it. And then, um, while I was out of the country, I got a, I got an email saying that, um, I had a call back for Scream 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 six and i was like when did i audition for scream six i don't remember (laughs) (laughs) i think i would remember that and um and then you know connected the dots that it was that it was the audition that i had done and um and it was i i found out that because they had given me um the speech that amber does when she reveals that she's ghost face um where she talks about like the, like fans and they're crazy and like uh, I, I can't I wish I could remember it <laughs> but um but but I had found out also that everybody got those sides so everyone I, I'm pretty sure Josh Segura also got those sides I know Devin got them like people were for whatever character you were playing you were reading as Ghostface so mm-hmm. um that and that made me think like maybe they don't know who goes faces yet. Maybe they're still writing it, but I had so much fun uh, reading that because I had, I'd only seen, I'd seen scream five in theaters um, probably like a couple months prior. And, and I didn't watch it again because I, I kind of wanted to do my own take of my, of, of the Amber speech. And I didn't want to like copy Mikey's performance. Um, And yeah, it was just really fun. I was just, being a psychopath <laughs> over zoom <laughs> and uh and then i yeah i found out i got it and they sent me the first two acts of the movie and i died in the first mm-hmm. two acts and i was like dang that's 
kind of a bummer, but I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm so happy to be a part of this. And, but I, I've said this a few times before, like if you're in a scream movie, you either want to be Ghostface, you want to be the final girl, or you want like a super epic death. And I yeah. didn't get any of those things. <laughs> and I was like, gosh, dang it. Like you don't even see my death. This sucks. And, um, and then I went and it actually worked in my favor because I told all of my friends I died and I was like genuinely sad about it. Yeah. You felt to so. All of them. Uh, and they were like, did you read the script? I'm like, yeah, I'm so sad. I'm dead. I like that. I'm like, literally the first person to die. This sucks. And, um, <laughs> and then when I got to Montreal, I was doing a fitting and um, the last outfit they brought in was the ghost face outfit. And they told me I needed to try it on. And I was like, Hell yeah. why? <laughs> wow. And, um, and that was, I have a really fun video of that, which is cool. And I was in complete shock. And we were filming a couple of days later. And I kind of sat down with Matt and Tyler and they explained everything to me and how I was related to the story. And, um, and then we just went for it. It was really, it was really fun. But, and I also feel like kind of grateful that I didn't know because mm -hmm. I do love the Scream franchise. And I, I'm glad that I didn't have a lot of time to think or worry too much about like yeah. the pressures that were to come because I mean, there definitely are. <laughs> I, um, being on set, you kind of start to notice how, I mean, people are searching constantly for answers while you're filming. Like you have to be aware of every photo you post, everything that you say, because people are dissecting everything. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah, it was, um, it was definitely challenging, but, but really fun. Can you, we, um, we were lucky enough to talk to radio silence right around the time of their release um, mm -hmm. and love their work. Like, ready or not is one of my favorite films um can you talk about the the atmosphere on set kind of that they they bring as directors because it's that you know obviously like if anyone has watched ready or not and then watched scream the vibes are so similar like they're so good at this grounded not comedy horror but horror with this uh different you know energy to it um i'm mm -hmm. just curious like kind of what the atmosphere is like on one of their sets they are so awesome <laughs> i <laughs> and they really i i couldn't i like can't say enough good things about them i feel like they've set such a high bar for me now that it's mm -hmm. going to be really hard for directors to top it <laughs> wow. but um it's and it's surprising too because you when you step into such a big as big of a responsibility as that movie is for a director um you would think that they would be i mean i know i would be like so overbearing so overprotective making sure right. that like nothing gets changed and they are the polar opposite like they I, and I do think that that's probably why these movies are so successful is because they know exactly what they want they cast who they want and then they like let people play and they're very trusting and have a very like loose grip on the creative process because you can tell they put in a lot of thought behind who they let in their circle. Um, and that was great. It honestly felt so collaborative um, and very welcoming. I've honestly, they said it time and time again when we were on set that they just really pride themselves in surrounding themselves with good people. And I genuinely think that's why they make good movies. And I think that's why a lot, like so many people come back and continue to do their movies. Yeah. Um, I can't wait to see everything that they, that they make after, after this. Yeah. I know it's going to be really great. They're going to have really, really long careers and hopefully I oh, can yeah be a part of more of their projects. Um, they even like, it was so, I've never been a part of a bigger movie and I've never felt more like welcomed and comfortable. I went like when I started to get to know them more, they were even saying, I told them that I was really interested in, um, you know, just the behind the scenes aspect of making movies and what it's like to, 
cut a movie together. And they were like, well, just come to the edit. And you always hear people say things like that. Yeah. And you're like, mm, I don't mean it. I don't want to bother anybody. And they genuinely meant it. I, I went and I sat on a couch with them in, in the edit for hours and just watched them. And I remember when I first walked in, they were like really talking to me a lot. And eventually I was like, guys, we don't have to talk. Like y'all just do your thing. Like I'm just here to watch you guys. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, great. And then that kind of, we kind of fell into a nice rhythm, which was nice. And I just would pop in and, and watch them edit, which was so fascinating. And um, it was just, it added a whole other element of like how much they care about these movies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. And yeah, they're just really, really, really cool people. Hell yeah. We well, hopefully enjoy we can team up with them again. Yeah. Because we, yeah, we, we, enjoyed... we love them and would love to see you in another one of their films too. We're just oh talking God. about their new monster movie or, or yeah, the, whatever. The secret project that they're doing. Yeah. I know yep. Melissa, she's she's on it right now and she told me about it. And um I think it's gonna be so cool. You're in for a treat for sure. I'm gonna like yes. freak out even thinking about it. Um, so we <laughs> obviously want to talk about um obviously want to talk about based on a true story. Um and really like, you know, the the whole show is based around this, but like true crime is obviously so huge. I mean, like, we would be remiss if we didn't say we're a part of the Morbid Podcast Network. Morbid is one of the biggest true crime podcasts in the universe. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts on it. Like, obviously. Again, spoilers, 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 but your character in episode six talks about the podcast and you have like a very specific way that you're, you know, that you feel about it, which is negative and you think that people should go to jail, which is very fair. Um, and they have a very different podcast than a normal true crime one. But what are your thoughts sure. on true crime in general? Are you like the mass population that is just head over heels in love with true crime? Yeah, I definitely am. I think playing the character that I played um, made me reflect a lot on my own <laughs> obsession. <laughs> okay, yeah. Because yeah. It, it is, and, and it really does, I, I think the show does, It's they do it in a funny way, but like we yeah. we all are like crazy obsessed. And yeah. I mean, I, I'm like probably like most people like obsessed with TikTok and and everything and people I'm there are people who take it upon themselves to like try to solve crimes. <laughs> yeah. One of the shows and, on yeah. our network. Yep. Yeah, yeah. we literally <laughs> yeah. take it upon ourselves as like a personal responsibility because we feel so connected to strangers. Mm -hmm. And um but yeah, I'm like I definitely don't take it that far, but I am definitely obsessed with with true crime. I actually don't, I don't know why, but I, I, my, my friend Priscilla, who's on the show, she listens to crime junkie, which I have listened to a few times and I really like, but I think I, I like, um, I like podcasts that are like a whole season of like one story. Okay. Sure. Um, okay. that I'm, I'm definitely more into, but, um, just maybe cause I like being tortured and I like the long game of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, I I think I listened to Serial first, and then uh, To Live and Die in L.A. is a really good one. Root mm -hmm. of Evil, Atlanta Murders. I think there's one called that. There's some. I mean, there's so many. And it's it's interesting. To, Go ahead, Sean. I was just going to say all the ones that I've I've listened to have been episodic. You know, like like a specific case. You know, at, at best a, a you know two or three parter. Um, so I'll have to listen back to this and grab some of the ones that you just said and listen to yeah. those. I haven't done a full season for a, for a specific case yet. Yeah. It's really, yeah. it's, it's really interesting, but also equally infuriating because there are still like, sometimes things are left open ended. Yep. Sure. Yeah. That but, unsolved yeah. aspect. So yeah. is that your favorite like perspective to listen to? Because there's the, you know, that, that seems kind of more factual. I guess not that, other podcasts aren't factual but it seems more kind of straight to the point where you have like you know morbid as an example right you know you have a, a former hairdresser and, and an autopsy tech which is like a very unique vantage point um and like their personalities you obviously have mfm which was huge and, and still is huge um and then you have things like you know women in crime is one that i know like my girlfriend listens to a lot where it's you know um two professors that are in criminal justice talking about these these crimes do you have a specific perspective that you like like do you like levity in the episodes 
Ooh, I actually have never listened to Women in Crime. I need to listen to that. Um, I definitely, mm, I'm trying to think a perspective that I like. You know, with Serial, it felt very factual. I'm pretty sure the woman that narrates that is a journalist. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was, she just sort of spits out facts. Like she tries not to like add, add much bias in it. And I did, mm-hmm. I really liked that. But then, you know, I listened to S Town. I don't know if any of you guys, if you guys have heard of that one, but mm-hmm. I mean, you're hearing from the person that the true crime situation like come like it literally you're like you feel like you're experiencing it firsthand like the man that you're hearing in your ears is also the man that like oh, i don't want to give it away <laughs> i well, I, um, got, like, I have to know You've said spoilers 18 million times i, I guess like uh, you know you, you just feel very close to the case because you're interested you are you're, you're hearing this person talk firsthand about about something and um so i like i like both perspectives honestly i think that um both kind of brought out different emotions in me for sure and yeah um yeah either one interesting which is totally fair i i you talked about the way that based on a true story uh kind of like shines a light on the various things about the true crime genre like you have um Uh, obviously like one of the best things about a lot of the true crime shows is you know people changing their perspective on things sharing stories about the victims and making sure that they're the the centerpiece like the the victims are the ones that you know they want to tell their story to make sure that they're remembered um but based on a true story even shines a light on that like kind of joking about how far that can go and singing like i will remember you uh which is a very funny part but made me kind of be like (laughs) what is what a like interesting thing because you don't you don't think about that anymore i mean i remember when listening to my favorite murder they stopped using the term prostitute and started using the term sex worker and and like kind of the learnings that come with the shows which i think is obviously super important um Mm. i'm curious just kind of going back to what you were saying about your show and how it made you look at your own you know um your own like listening habits, I guess, what did you realize or did you, did anything change at all? Or did you keep? Yeah. I mean, I do feel like, uh, media has, uh, desensitized us a lot Mm -hmm. from, from like the human experience. I mean, sometimes you, I mean, like you scroll on, on Twitter or on Instagram or wherever. And you can see like some really dark things sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And, and I, and I do feel like even listening to podcasts, sometimes you don't really like realize that the people behind these stories are actually real and, and, and are going through, or have went through something really traumatizing. And obviously, um, obviously this is like based on a true story is a bit more of a heightened version of that. Like of course. obviously of course. most people aren't, <laughs> aren't singing those songs or, yeah. or, or like looking out of, of like the mother of a victim and being like, how are you? Like, <laughs> like right. most well, aren't yeah. really doing that, but we're fo- or hopefully not. But then you see people who like for views are going to the scene of a crime or, yeah. you know, something like that, you know, there are, and I think that more so is what we're trying to tap into is like people, the, the links at which some people are willing to go to get attention. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it like the commentary in the show has been so surprising and and like fresh and funny like just the way that they yeah. do it uh it is, it the is writing, fantastic the writing is a plus yeah i i grew up watching like cold case files and unsolved mysteries and stuff and and all you know that morbid curiosity has always been in there and it's because of great shows like you know uh my favorite murder and and morbid and stuff like that that have made me realize like you know you can't just have the morbid cure well i guess it's it's much better to, if you're gonna have that morbid curiosity like don't you have to you have to 
keep yourself grounded in the reality of it and and shows that that focus on the important aspects and aren't just milking it you know turning killers into into icons is is really important there, there actually is a like a a company that i that i found scrolling on tiktok of course and mm -hmm. they sort of turned their curiosity and like this feeling of like personal connection into like actual forensic research that they they post about like a case and and they get funding through media um mm -hmm. and to, like act to dive deep and like do more research that maybe like the cops or the FBI aren't, aren't looking into, and they've solved a lot of cases because of it, but doing something like that is beautiful. Like that is, yeah. that yeah. is, I think, beauty behind social media and like feeling that personal connection, but it's uh, not always do you come across yes. people who go that far. A hundred percent. And I think both are okay. You know, like you, it's, it's okay to have that morbid curiosity, but yeah, it's uh, keeping, keeping uh, the real goals and uh, and people, the victims in in our heads is, is huge. I do have to ask a little bit about the filming process. Um, I'm specifically thinking of episode six, that dinner scene in my head. Um, it, it just seems like based on a true story is such a fun set. Uh, just, I, I couldn't imagine getting through. I mean, obviously a lot of intense things happen in that episode. Uh, but there's some lines that are just so funny, and I was trying to figure out how you guys were not busting out laughing. Can you talk a bit about, you know, what it's like on set and and working with your cast, and specifically that episode? If you have any stories from that, because it, it's my I love the whole show, but that the episode scene, yes, hit me so right good. in the face. It, it oh right yeah, face. So honestly, good. it was really hard. It was really hard to get through get through a lot of stuff. You you definitely would have to like pick your moments to crack. And if you were going to crack, like crack for a second and then get back at it. Um, mm -hmm. But we really did have so much fun filming. There was like not a day that I was on set that Kaylee and Chris especially weren't making me laugh. Um, and that dinner table scene specifically <laughs> when um, <laughs> when uh, Ruby and her husband were fighting across the table yeah. Um, yeah. they were, you know, they were just doing their lines and the camera was on Chris and Kaylee. So they kind of got to, and Chris and Kaylee didn't have any scripted lines in that moment, but the camera was on them. So of course you're, you're going to improvise. And Kaylee like literally improvised an entire thing of like, guys, my water broke. I think I'm giving birth and like trying to stop, but like <laughs> they just were so creative and you're just sitting across and watching this like brilliance happen and you're just laughing so hard. I don't think it, I don't think it made it into the, into the edit, but it was so fun to watch, but there was stuff like that happening all the time. <laughs> yeah. All of it, the single, I, I, like all the single shots in that scene are so good because just everyone's reactions and, and you see people even like the second table that's never referenced the second table of people they're like so distraught because they're experiencing <laughs> like second hand embarrassment it's it's so good and just so Honestly, the um those background actors were such troopers because we were filming that like those scenes because there were a few moments at that dinner table we were filming it for like a week i mean there was mm -hmm. so much to cover oh, shit and those actors were on it the entire time. It was really impressive because we were over here like getting stir crazy and silly and they were just yeah. on their A game. It was very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. It was funny and even just to watch like there were there were moments where, you know, all this I think one person's even standing behind you. I think it was uh you know, her husband standing behind during during their fight and you just you're you're not doing anything you're just looking down and even just like the small things like that were so funny to me i'm yeah. this uh the, the show is really hard to describe it 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 seems like it's this intense like rom-com meta drama thriller uh how talking about improv how do you guys balance that mood like that that mood so perfectly and and I, I guess I don't know what I'm trying to ask there. It's it's how do you pull it off? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the writing a, lot and the improv. It, a lot of it is trust in the writing because because Craig, our showrunner who wrote this, who wrote the season, um, has a very I mean, from the moment you met him, he has a very clear idea of where every character is going, and mm -hmm. so um, like even for my character, 
Um, she's a little bit more of the straight man. And um, like there are moments of comedy with her, but for the most part, she's a little bit more of like the lighthouse and the compass, like moral compass in the show. And um, there were certainly moments where tonally I would look around and watch Kaylee like being Kaylee and then Chris like also just like the two of them just riffing off of each other and I would go like am I in the same show <laughs> because <laughs> the character is so serious at times yeah. and um and yeah but but it it does check a lot of boxes in in different genres but I think that's what's so fun about it it's like a very unhinged show in like a fun yes. way <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I think you're... that's the that's the good thing about a lot of the shows on streaming services now. Um and I have my love hate with streaming services. I obviously <clears throat> love Peacock, but I, <laughs> you know, like the one thing is you can have all these different things. Like, you know, you have uh the jokes that you're telling and the kind of r- really raunchy nature of the show at some points, and then you can have a woman getting uh, you know, kebobbed by a, an umbrella in Vegas. Like it's <laughs> it has like a weird dichotomy that you can't really find anywhere else. And like, that's, you know, things like yellow jackets kind of do that. They have the same nature. And, um, you know, while it was, uh, it was on TV, like Hannibal's obviously way more serious, but like Hannibal toyed with that nature too, where you're balancing these different things. Um, I'm just really glad that based on a true story, didn't pull back any of the goriness. There's a good amount of the gore yeah. and like actual horrific elements, uh, that I feel like is a good balance that you need, you know, the balance is yeah. so perfect. That is the beauty of being on a streamer because you don't really have as many boundaries with that. And people uh, kind of going back to what we were talking about are so desensitized these days. Like going there isn't that scary anymore. Like people kind of long for it now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so before we let you go, uh, we normally end all of our interviews with a section that we call mostly horror recommendations, which is where, We ask you to recommend some films to our listeners, uh, but we're going to change it up a little bit here because obviously we do our research and um, you have some favorites that you've mentioned in other interviews that we want to talk about a, because they're some of our favorites and B because we want your, your thoughts on them. Um, First, but this works perfectly too, because we normally ask for like a, a horror adjacent movie or show and then a fully horror one. So the first thing I want to talk about is what we would call your mostly. And you've said that you really like a ghost story. Um, Mm -hmm. A ghost story is amazing. And David Lowry Mm -hmm. is amazing. And I'm curious what it is about a ghost story that you enjoy. uh, If it's just um, the, the, the full pie being eaten in one take, or if there's other aspects (laughs) that you are a fan of. Um, So I am pretty notorious in my friend group for liking like very um, like, formulated films so like act one act two act three it's like sandwiched pacing wise it all makes sense um and and a ghost story is not that (laughs) and i remember um i was invited by a friend to go see the movie um at the dga building it was before it came out and i sat down and watched it and i I was completely proven wrong by my own like opinions on things. I like, I remember crying in the moment after the, there was like the bang on the piano and they go get in bed after. And there's like the longest moment of just the two of them trying to fall back asleep. And I think they're just facing each other. And I was like, that is such a beautiful and accurate depiction of just what being in love looks like. Um, that I really had never seen before because I was so used to watching movies that were just following a formula. And um, it that scene in particular, like, stole my heart. And then the rest of the film is just flawless to me. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think it just kind of introduced me to a a world of filmmaking and approach and an approach to filmmaking that I wasn't used to, um, or wasn't that open to. 
um, it's just a really, really, really good film. And I feel like too, as someone who can be like an ambassador of like someone who likes, you know, more by the book films, mm -hmm. like, like my stamp of approval can be on it. And so yeah, sure. like, I, I suggest it to so many people because I'm like, trust me, you're, you're going to love it. It's a little different, but it's, but it's like, it's a, it's a flawless film. Yeah. I think it's also a film that like, if someone's like, I didn't get it, you can kind of explain it a little bit and then they rewatch it again and hopefully we'll enjoy it the second, like, you know, we'll get it with a little bit of context. Um, yeah. I love, I love a ghost story and it reminds me of, um, Andrei Tarkovsky, old uh, Russian filmmaker, has a film called Mirror, which is mm -hmm. like very similar. Um, and it's it's like the closest thing that I've ever seen to that film. And they're both so good. Um, and so I just love David Lowry in general. Like, I hope he continues to knock it out of the park. He's so great. He actually, my friend sent me a um, a podcast he was on where he talked about a movie that I was in. And I lost it. I was like, oh my God, he has seen something that I've been in. I couldn't believe it. And so, and I sent him an email um, just thanking him for watching uh, the, the Beach House and just told him how much his movie meant to me. And he was so lovely. I would just love to work with him one day. Hell yeah. We'll, we'll bring that up it's, when we're we, manifesting when we, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Eventually we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, the other thing yeah. that we want to mention is something else that you talked with. You said that you would love to work with Mike Flanagan, which yeah. uh, it's no surprise. Mike is, is firmly rooted in the horror space. Um, what's your favorite favorite? What's your favorite Flavor. Flanagan? Uh, listen, we're going to skip over that. What's your favorite Flanagan <laughs> series or film? Like I'm, I'm really curious. He's obviously it's all, all hits, no misses in my opinion, but. Yeah. I agree. Um, I would say right now I love Midnight Mass. Um, yes. I thought that was such a good series. Oh my god! The as an actor, it just seemed like the most challenging thing in the world to have to sit down and do like pages and pages of dialogue. Yeah. Um, I loved the oh, concept. Yeah. Um, I I just and I thought all of the actors were so perfect and. Uh, I just I I love like just the tone in his movies and the mm -hmm. visuals and even and Midnight Mass too like it really wasn't as scary as um, Hill House, um, but just so meaty and so interesting. I mean, I think I blew through that show in like a couple days, which it yeah. was. It's like a lot. It's like pretty long episodes. Um, yeah. And then I also really loved. I know it's kind of a bummer. It was only one season. It was um, Midnight um, Club. It's a Midnight Club. Yes. Yeah. Um, I really liked Midnight Club. I liked that he kind of stepped to the YA world a bit. Um, that's also one of my favorite books. Um, it's a really beautiful book. Um, and I really like that. And I'm so excited for House of Usher, too. I think that's going to be really good. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. geeked on House of Usher. Did uh, you? I have to say, I was, yes. I, I was just going to say, I, uh, I was just at a convention and Annabeth Gish was there. And I was in the elevator with her for like several mm -hmm. floors. And she was so nice. And I just had to drop that. Because since we're talking about Midnight <laughs> Mass, what were you going to say, Steve? She was Did so you... nice. It like coming up <laughs> She's so yeah shout out to annabeth did you uh did you read what flanagan posted about like what season two would have been for midnight club i did and okay. i am so happy he did that i yeah. think that it is i mean i think it, it on it i mean not that i could respect him any more than i already do but i i feel like People, especially like he recognizes that he has a huge and loyal fan base and he yeah. wanted to give them the closure that they were looking for. Yeah. And I don't think I've really ever heard of a filmmaker doing that for their fans before. And that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was unprecedented. And, and while I wanted the second season, at least gave me a little bit of closure, which is uh, much needed in, in content sometimes. Um, yeah. Well, Liana, thank you again for spending time with us and chatting with uh, chatting with us about these various things. Um, before we let you go, um, obviously, based on a true story, is out now. Anything else you want to plug? I know that you, you know, you you're you're uh, very philanthropic. You work, um, you know, with a lot of philanthropic uh, things. Anything that you kind of wanted to talk about before we let you go? Oh man, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, actually, there's a there's a 
there's a foundation that I've that I've been close to for a while, honestly, ever since I um I signed on to trust. It's called the Rape Foundation. It's an incredibly educational um and and um eye opening foundation. And I would honestly just guide people in that direction. Um it's just a I it really like opened my eyes to a lot of things. And I know that um David Schwimmer in particular has been connected to it for a really long time. So I just, I just guide people there, honestly. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we'll put links to the foundation in our description. So if you're listening to this now, check the description so you can go there. Uh, Liana, thank you again for being on the show. We sincerely appreciate your time. All right. Thank you guys again so much for listening to our interview with Liana Liberato. And again, thank you so much to Liana for being on our show. Hopefully we can get her back. Uh, She said she wants to dabble even further in the genre. So we would love for her to dabble and to dabble on to the show again. Um, We, we asked and you answered, you, you emailed us. We have been asking for emails for quite some time um, as well as Twitter and and Instagram DMS. uh, And we finally got some, um and so we wanted to read some listener submitted mostly horror recommendations for you guys this week and i'm gonna start uh with one we got a couple weeks ago so this one goes hello guys sean it's a different different spelling sean from nc gonna pop some wrecks i like that i like the the starting (laughs) sentence hello guys sean from nc gonna pop some racks that sounds like an old school like when hip-hop was invented 50 years ago you know it's the 50th anniversary of hip-hop this year when hip-hop was invented 50 years ago uh that's what rap sounded like hey guys sean from nc gonna pop some racks and walk down the block gonna snap some necks yep rapper career (laughs) bars all right uh Hello, guys. Sean from NC. Going to pop some Rex. Love the show, guys. Great job. Found the podcast on the Clock app when Sean was showing off his Goosebumps collection. Now a weekly listener. Yeah. Love very it. Very cool. Love um, it. His Rex for horror, he said The Ritual. And for mostly, he said All Quiet on the Western Front and Blood and Gold. Thoughts? Um, well, so obviously we love the ritual here. We had David Bruckner yes. on. We've had, uh, yes. you know, uh, Josh and Sierra from Russell Russell FX. So we've talked yes. uh, a good bit about that movie. It's a great movie, Sleeper. If you guys still haven't watched it, you need to do that. Uh, so love that, Rex Sean. I don't know the other two movies though. I haven't seen All um, Quiet. All Quiet I've on the heard Western Front. It. I recommended. Yeah, I recommended. Yeah. It some some okay. weeks ago, maybe a, maybe nice. months ago now. I've never heard Brandon. Blood and Gold, so we'll have to look that up. Um, yeah but yeah, i have don't no know anything about it but that's what we're looking for no man info. give us give us wrecks like that hell yeah we will check them out and once we watch them we will comment and say like oh we watched this so <laughs> thank I you will, sean i will say all quiet on the western front slaps so watch right. that on netflix now um and then the other mostly horror wreck that we got this week mm-hmm. is from a listener that we found out is a wondery listener so they get to hear our episodes early and ad free on Wondery Plus. So shout out to all of our Wondery listeners. But uh, this one is from uh, from Krista. She says her name. I'm gonna say Krista. Um, and this is her kind of responding to our uh, Frankenstein episode with um, Bomani J story. So a little bit of that in here. But she okay. says, "Hey Stephen Sean, I'm first. Ha <laughs> ha. Hey Stephen Sean, first I'll start with my recommendations." I recently went to a ghost hunting convention type thing with a company called Straight Strange Escapes. Tons of people I follow on TV, social, and podcasts were there. They were all amazing. A couple of the folks are Dana and Greg Newkirk. Mm, I know them. They have the Haunted Objects podcast, which is her recommendation one. And they did a docu-series called Hellier, recommendation oh. two, streaming on Prime and on YouTube. So quick aside, nice. I think we've talked about Hellier a little bit. I a little. I st- season. Yeah, yeah, I still haven't, haven't seen, seen anything. It. Yeah. Um, I'll withhold my thoughts, I guess, for now. Sure. But um, she goes on to say tons of Mothman slash injured cold ties, uh, aliens, oh, fake yeah. conspiracy. It's a wild fucking ride and so good. I couldn't stop They're watching. Not, here. I have a new documentary out sometime in the near future. Um, so, yeah, those nice. are cool. The, the Haunted Objects podcast, 
we'll have to look into. I've never heard of that yeah. before. Um, and yeah, then absolutely. Hellier, Hellier, I would recommend for sure mm -hmm. um, as well. But as I said, I kind of lost me in the second season. But um, her next rec, uh, she says, is Dash Cam. So I will throw out Dash Cam is directed by Rob Savage, who directed The Boogeyman, which we talked about kind of at the beginning of this <laughs> episode. Nice. He also directed a film uh, that came out during quarantine called um, Host, which is great. It's not yeah, the which you love. Film. Yeah, I love yeah. Host. Uh, yeah. It's 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 nearly a perfect little 60 minute film um she says i don't think i've heard you talk about dash cam in my social and political standings the first third of the mu of the movie was infuriating interesting so in my social and political standings the first one third of the movie was infuriating i hated the main character she seriously pissed me off i almost turned it off a number of times but i stuck it out and it ended up with a rad monster great settings good gore and actually a discussion with my 15 year old son about whether in the film universe she i'm not gonna spoil this i'm gonna chris i'm sorry okay. i'm gonna cut this off because there's a bit of a spoiler here okay. um but she goes on to say no surprise my kid is a really good person um they basically had a discussion about uh the morality of what happens in the ending of the film okay which is fair it's sure. good if you can yeah. you can watch a horror film with your 15 year old son and have a conversation about the morality of the de of the the deaths or whatever then that's uh that's pretty good that's what the genre is about. Um, yes. Yeah, I'll have to check it out. I'm pretty sure I've heard of Dash Cam. I, I wonder if someone even uh, has recommended it, um, you know, one of our guests in the past, uh, which we still need to, to go through that. But yeah, I, uh, I have been wanting to watch Host forever. I couldn't, I can't tell you if I liked Boogeyman, just like you said. Um, you know, I yeah. truly need to rewatch that movie again because I feel like I didn't even experience it. But thank you. For the Rex, I um. She's not I'll done. She's not done. Oh, she's not done. Okay, she's not done. She says, as far as Frankenstein goes, I've always been a fan and especially a fan of Mary Wollstonecraft. And then in parentheses, Shelley. I didn't realize Mary Shelley wasn't her maiden name. Wollstonecraft yeah. is her maiden name. Interesting. Um, as a teen girl, learning about her was really inspiring. She also says, also Penny Dreadful's inclusion of the Frankenstein story. God damn it, I love that show. Another recommendation. I've never seen Penny Dreadful, but I do know it was canceled, which I've seen a lot of people upset about. And then she says, mm -hmm. so there's an email for you two delightful humans. I'm also excited to see Boogeyman. Hopefully you see it in a the good theater. Uh, and now the angry black girl and her monster. Thanks for what you do, Krista. That's the end. Of it. Uh, there was a, there was a Krista, lot of wrecks there, but that's okay. We love. Yeah, them. no, love that. Uh, Krista, thank you so much for writing us. I want to say Penny Dreadful. Um, I had it recommended to me a handful of times and it caught my attention, like the thumbnails for it. I think like right around mm -hmm. the same time I was becoming aware of it on my own as I was starting to hear about it. And I watched the first like three episodes and dude, I tried really hard and I just couldn't get into it. Um, it no. was, it was just on those, uh, just in that sort of like that drama TV that, that uses horror as an aesthetic for me, at least, at least where I was. Yeah. Not, it, not quite supernatural about it, but just like okay. in, in that realm a little bit. Um, but I don't know. It's, I have wanted to give it another shot because I think I've, I've seen people talking about it online ongoing and I know that it has a pretty serious, um, hardcore fan base so yeah maybe say, krista you following. yeah krista you might have uh inspired me to to give that another shot very soon so that and dash cam hell yeah are, are gonna be yeah and host I guess, and you gotta watch host that. yeah you gotta put yeah. host, on <laughs> host is yeah. so good I've, i haven't seen dash cam but host is great um any do you have any off the cuff wrecks before we let uh let the listeners go we stop Dude. holding them hostage go find this is a this is a, an experience one and i guess i kind of did it earlier but dude if you're the if you're the kind of person there's there's a lot of I actually just saw a tiktok about this today if you're the kind of person who doesn't doesn't go and do anything because you feel that you don't have someone to do it with or your schedules don't line up with friends or anything like that take yourself out man like go out go eat at the place by yourself go see the thing by yourself go to the concert alone um go to the bar alone. It's, I mean, be safe. I'm not, please be safe, especially yeah. if, if alcohol is involved. Um, highly, yeah. highly, highly, highly. I'm, I'm not saying that, but don't, 
tell yourself that you can't do stuff alone or, or feel weird about doing it. Go find yourself a, a weird store or bar or something that you haven't been into and just go, just go see what it's like. And if you don't like it after 20 minutes, then you can go home and watch your shows. Um, so that's my rec for the week is get out and do something alone. That's a good rec. Sean says <laughs> touch grass. We love it. Yeah, dude. Um, all right. <laughs> touch grass, note, grab ass, uh, man. <laughs> thank you guys as always for listening. Uh, you know, we really appreciate it. And we're, this might be episode 111 or something. Like, I don't even know what episode it is, but uh, we're getting we're getting high up in the numbers and uh, yeah. just appreciate everyone always. Um, I think it's 112. As always, it's fine. Who cares? Uh, yeah. As always, <laughs> you know, send us an email <laughs> if you want us to read your recommendations like we just did with uh, Krista and Sean. Yeah, no send relation. more. Send, more. Uh, send us send emails, more. mostly horror movie night at gmail.com. You can also send us uh, I almost said digital messages, direct messages on Instagram where we're at mostly horror pod. We also have a Twitter and a TikTok that are at mostly horror. And I'm on all the things that Steven is average and Sean's everywhere at hypocrite ink or hypocrite dot ink. I think that's everything that I have to say again, listen yeah. early or add free on wondering plus, and we will catch you guys next week. Goodbye.